Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and always, as always, the yang to my yin, Susan Hobson's here. Susan, how are you? I am fabulous because the sun is finally shining here in Toronto. We've had one of our darkest winters of all time, so I am definitely banking this vitamin D. How about you, buddy? You're definitely not having that same experience today, are you? <laughs> No, no, I'm not banking the vitamin D, at least for the last couple of weeks here. We're out in Edmonton and the sunshine is lacking a little bit, but we're still rolling full steam. And as always, we've got to start off with a quote. Mm -hmm. And I have one here from the author Anais Nin. And she says, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. Oh, I love that quote. Tell us why you picked that one today. Well, one of those is um, I have a track from our friend Sonny Strasberg that I've been using a lot lately, and she uses this quote. And it's something that I've even been working with my leaders with recently is there's an element of being pushed to grow and not remaining static in if you want to achieve those next level goals. And it does take that discomfort, but there becomes a point where this exactly happens is there's a moment where it's untenable to stay at status quo. And so we have to jump. Mm -hmm. Time to expand, right? That pressure is a privilege. That's what we say in our dream team locker room, right? Because that pressure that we experience when it's time to grow is how we actually develop more and more of our capacity. So I love this quote so much. Thank you, Sonny. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Sonny. And obviously, we have a special guest today. We have Dussel, Dr. Russell Thackeray, the CEO and founder of QED Organizational Development and the host of Resilience Unraveled. Russell, how are you? I'm good. I've never been introduced as Dussel before, though, so I'm, I'm thinking of changing my brand. I quite like that. <laughs> my my uh, my words are a little bit jumbled today, but we'll we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be good for the next fifty minutes, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> Susan, I think so, it's over to you. <laughs> That's right. Well, we have two more pods after this too, so wow. it's going to be really good. Um, Luckily, I was first. <laughs> that's right. So, Russell, before we get more into you, what do you think about the quote? Uh, it's lovely. It's lovely, but I also think um, the way you've described it in terms of leadership is quite fascinating because I think there's an assumption of growth, but actually sometimes staying the same, but innovating and making things easier, but staying the same size is also quite interesting. So you can be utterly transformed, but still the same size. I work with an organization at the moment who are desperate to grow, very miserable, desperate to grow, because they think that if you don't grow, they'll go backwards. And my point is, actually, you could be doing the same amount of revenue and profit with half the effort. That's still growth. <laughs> it's a different form of growth, though, isn't it? And it's about thinking differently about the, about the paradigm of growth, always being bigger or faster or richer or whatever that might be. Sometimes easier, happier, slicker, quicker. It's just as good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But the one thing I like about buds is I think it also says something about the um, the fragility of plants as well and the need to nurture them and need to look after them and to feed them and to water them and such like and how easily it can be bruised and damaged. And that's really important when you come to people's mental health, physical health, whatever, whatever else, psychological health. And that's really important as well in, in business. As we're definitely going to talk about today with our resiliency expert. But Russell, let's rewind the game tape a little bit before we get this party started. Let's plug our folks into you a little bit. Tell our folks a little bit about who you are and what brought you to this mission around resiliency in the world. Well, thank you. Um, it's always interesting when I come on a podcast because you most tell when you work with Americans when they say things like, tell us about yourself. And when I ask that on my podcast and 45 minutes later, they're still introducing themselves, you find that Brits are slightly more self-effacing. And well, <laughs> I'm I'm rubbish at, at uh, basically marketing myself. So I'm just going to give you the truncated version. But um, 
my original career was a professional musician. So years and years and years ago, I was a musician. I used to play in the West End of London. I used to be um, with the big symphony orchestra as a freelance classical musician. And then I left that, went to the corporate life, went into sales, marketing, um, eventually ended up a CEO of one of the largest legal firms in the UK, bought a consultancy, worked in a consultancy, sold a consultancy, started a training company, massive training company, sold a training company, retired at a very early age, got bored and divorced, which meant I had to go back to work again. And because uh, in the UK, that's, that's expensive. And um, and I spent the last really I don't know since the last five or six years ago just talking about the subjects of resilience, potential, capacity, and playing around with some other ideas. And it's been a fascinating thought process resilience because it's a word you know what's like uh, these words appear don't they and then they and they sort of get degraded like stress. Stress is a word that has virtually no meaning anymore. Resilience has sort of kept its shape though a little bit. So. We're still using it at the moment, but um, always, always looking to leap forward and think what else there might be in the world. And I think there's a move towards greater mental health, but I still see resilience as being a really good gathering point for hanging together lots of different concepts and ways of thinking about the world. And as you say, in terms of a mission, I have a podcast which is all about resilience. We've got a little resilience book that people can buy, and we do a lot of work and training development around resilience. And you know, we're actually countering this move now against this theory of toxic resilience as well, which has become the new thing. I think it's a it's a classic classic thing in marketing, isn't it? You create a new concept, that concept becomes massive, and then in order to keep it going, you put the word toxic in front of it or three point <laughs> zero behind it. So soon we'll have toxic resilience four point eight, and then we'll all be you know it's just a it's a contrivance that con many consultants use to just uh, you know fund the next book or do whatever but of course you'll all just be thinking that we brits are very cynical and it really is just our sense of humor so uh, forgive me because i just caught myself there <laughs> remembering <laughs> this message is going out over the <laughs> pond <laughs> we love sarcasm in canada too probably cuz you know we're led by the brits originally <laughs> So, Colonial com commoners, as we call you. <laughs> I'm, cu I'm curious to rewind this game tip again, because surely oh. there had to be something along the way in your hero's journey that called you to start investigating this whole topic around resilience. So what originally inspired you to start digging into this topic itself? Well, I've always been interested and it, it might be slightly less um, exciting than you than you hope, actually. But I've always been interested in the future and being ahead of the trend. And all the way through my life, I've been at the bleeding edge of thought leadership. And uh, that means I'm very, very good at spotting the future, spotting what's coming, and then being very poor at exploiting it. And may, therefore, I'm not a multimillionaire. Sorry about that. I really have to work. <laughs> I'm you know, currently doing interest in, interim roles as a CEO and a sales marketing director because actually I don't spend my time writing books. I like to actually be doing leadership and work. So I, I bumped into the term um, quite a while ago was a colleague of mine actually began to talk about it and talk about the future and resilience of what it was. And I was one of the people right at the very beginning who hated this definition of bouncing bouncing back and was one of the first people to coin the term bouncing forward. And this idea that when you that resilience is a natural form of life, it's it's something that we should all be doing because inherent within it are the concepts of accountability and learning. And once we began to think about that, we, we could apply it to potential and to capacity and to performance and such like. And then suddenly got it interesting. And then suddenly we realized we were talking about resilience in a different sort of way. And this idea that, you know, resilience is something to be feared uh, or poor resilience was an issue and that we should avoid mistakes and we should avoid burning out and we should avoid all these different things rather than seeing these opportunities for fresh growth, enhancement of potential and really thinking about that differently. There was no one particular thing that sparked my attention. But I do remember the moment when we first, first talked about it. We were in King's Cross Station in England, which is a very, very busy railway station. And uh, none of the trains run on time. It's very famous for that. <laughs> and a colleague and I were sitting in Starbucks talking about it. And we suddenly started talking about the concept. And that was the very first time we really, we really started to under, in, investigate this. And that was... 
probably 15, 20 years ago. So it was a long time before everybody else was thinking about it. And we, we've we wrestled with all the marketing terms. We've, we've got rid of the idea of resilience. We called it agility and resilience together. So we came up with agilience. And, you know, we're like, oh, my goodness, we have tortured the marketing um, workbook in terms of thinking what comes next. But no, we quite like the term. I quite like it. I quite like to keep it. And um, for the moment, we're sort of hanging on to the term. And I mean, with 400 episodes of Resilience and Ravels, it's going to be really hard to rebrand. So we're still there. So, Russell, I'd love to hear, like, one is what's resiliency, but also I've never heard of toxic resiliency. So I'd love that definition, too. Well, resilience... um, itself is this idea that um, that it has two features, one which has been able to uh, weather the storm in a sense, you know, to be able to endure, to be able to push through. And the second thing is when you break, you're able to bounce back. They're the, the tr- traditional definitions. And, um, and of course, what, ha- what has happened is lots of organizations have thought about this and thought, well, actually, we need to build the resilience of people. So in other words, we need them to be able to be more likely to weather the storm, to have more grit, which is a very famous book that was written, and to have more determination, which are um, arguably character traits rather than skills, but also to be able to bounce back and to come back, as it were. So in other words, investing in people's ability to get back to work, stop complaining about things and uh, I'll use the phrase man up and I'm doing my parenthesis there fingers and come back to work and stop being a wimp and just get on with life and such like and so organizations have invested in people's resilience and you can see how toxic resilience might manifest itself then because actually if you're not being brave if you're not manning up enough if you don't have enough grit if you're not seen to be longest at work uh, hardest working producing the most winning you know being the winner all that sort of stuff you can see how the concept of resilience could become toxic the word itself can be abused and i maintain there is no such thing as toxic resilience i only maintain there is a thing called toxic leadership Whoa, another That's one we talked about on your show <laughs> it might have been <laughs> yeah that's what i was gonna say that's another one of our favorite hot topics to unpack around here but uh, yeah, you obviously are on the cutting edge, right? Uh, cutting edge of, of leadership development by focusing on resiliency itself, because neuroscience now proves that it predicts 80% of a person's potential, right? Only 20% of our p- potential is actually predicted by our IQ, 80, a whopping 80% is predicted by our EQ and our AQ. AQ well, would... being adaptability quotient. Have you heard about that yeah. terminology? Yeah, okay. So uh-huh. that measures I... resiliency, right? And, and what's even more interesting about that is that the idea of IQ is so old fashioned out the, out the building as people are just giving up on the idea of IQ. If you've ever looked at the history of IQ, you will stop using it immediately because it is so riven with faults and false mm-hmm. assumptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, fascinating. If you ever get the chance, to, uh, there's a book I, I can know. drop you the link afterwards. It really is a terrible I, idea. I agree. I took a, a class at Princeton, actually, my yeah. sophomore year on that very topic. And it yeah. was talking Good about how yeah. toxic it was to just try to encapsulate intelligence in that one way, right? Because yeah. there's so many different forms of intelligence that actually go into how a person performs, right? Yeah. And assuming intelligence itself is even a thing. Ooh, tell us more about that. Well, it's like any sort of construct is is just literally a construct isn't it it's mm-hmm. been it's been invented or constructed to explain something mm-hmm. so the fact that we we talk about someone's innate ability to do something we talk about their ability to have the mental or physical acuity to do that and then mm-hmm. the ability to execute it and they're two different things and then we just called them intelligence and Howard Gardner took this construct really to the nth degree by creating initially what was it nine intelligences and then went good went mad and went up to 20 i think in the end and and then you just realize that you know social constructivism is something that means you can just take any word and ex- apply it to anything else and what happens in that process is we lose what's called semantic degradation i think rob and i you and i talked about that now this is my podcast is this idea that words have no meaning and intelligence really has no meaning anymore so when we talk about intelligence we don't know what it really means 
Hmm. But we've got to measure something, haven't we? Because schools have mm -hmm. to measure outcomes, so we have to pretend to measure intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we get the actually often just the uh, the most socially gifted people in a in a room together, and then surprise, surprise, if we teach against the test, they come out with the highest scores, and then the school gets the most funding. And then we've got we've got a, a we've got a community of people who have quite low resist, uh, resilience because actually the vast majority of people who go through that process are not winners; they're all losers because you can only have one winner. So we don't train people in the concept of how to deal with failure right from an early age. Mm -hmm. It's it's a feature of parenting, isn't it, that we have increased levels of poor resilience. Now, where's that coming from? Well, a otherwise, a otherwise, well, it could be it could be parenting, which is the ultimate form of leadership. It could mm -hmm. be all sorts of different things. It could be societal expectations. It could be uh, many things. But the but in our in terms of our own businesses, absolutely leadership. If you have a, a leader who is often flawed themselves, and it's often attachment theory that makes a leader really flawed. And if you have a leader that's flawed, they will have a flawed business and they will have a flawed company and the company cannot grow bigger than the the, the ability of the leader to sort of manage it all completely at the, the level of micro detail against their need to control. So mm -hmm. there you go. You've heard all these terms before, but uh, I'm quite keen on this idea that language is very important in the way we think about things and that's where we think about stress it's such as it's the way that we talk about stress and pressure is totally different when we think about psychology to for example engineering and the problem with psychology or modern psychology it was all the language for it was was taken from engineering because we were thinking about engin engineering in the workplace in the 1950s. So we took those words from that time. So we talk about stress as being something which in physiology terms is different to what an engineering degree of stress is. The same with pressure. In, you know, pressure in engineering is something, an, an external force. In psychology, it's an internal force. The fact that pressure is down to you, not to the environment. It's your ability to handle that external, those external forces that make it. So you talked about pressure and roses earlier and when we were talking about that sort of thing. For me, pressure is all internal. So there's, no, there's nearly all pressure is expectation or workload. So um, when you start thinking about pressure, pressure is a good thing, but only if you decide that something is pressured. And that's why people use pressure deliberately as a, perform a performance enhancer, enhancing game. That's what it's called. Let's get into this a little bit because I feel like we have to- oh, we're do resilience. <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i want to get deeper on right is like if there's any leaders out there that are listening to this thinking about this very construct um and they're curious in terms of how they can actually start to build resiliency in their people and on their teams how would a leader think about that or speak about that to their teams linguistically great okay well first thing um it's, it's a great question that what's the first thing you do and 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 you are and, uh, and the glib answer is you start with yourself but let, but let's not start with ourselves because that is too glib let's start by assuming that everybody in our company or our organization whether it's a pangalactic corporation through to a two-person um setup let's assume they're all adults for a moment let's just start there and let's start treating people as if they are adults, which means let's stop second guessing how they're going to feel and how they're going to react and all those different things and just build a culture where people can be themselves. So we stop thinking about people's ability to choose to take offence and actually just start to be congruent ourselves and have good intentions and talk to people as adults and they'll start to perform. Trust them to do their jobs let them get on, recognize they're going to fail, learn from those failures through accountability and come back and start to work better and faster and harder for themselves. Because everybody that works in your organization or any organization truly works for themselves with just your brand outside the front door. So it's about how can your brand liberate that person's individual interests to be able to achieve what they want to achieve through the construct of your company. And I think once you do that and start to treat people as adults and have this idea that actually, do you know what, they're here for a reason because I'm paying them and they're giving me something back. And if I'm a very good leader, I can get them to do more than we pay them for because that's how you get profits. Then, you know, that's what we're trying to do here is trying to treat people as adults. And when I go to organizations and I see low resilience, what I see is parent-child cultures. So I see bosses who are frightened to give feedback. 
I see bosses who don't sit down and say things as they should be said because we're A, frightened of what might the reaction might be or frightened to be taken to court. And in most cases, if you just treat people honorably and as adults, people actually want a good working environment where things that need to be said can be said because the vast majority of people who come to work prefer to do the best job they can, not the worst. But then that's very theory X. And that's going back to the 50s for you. <laughs> I don't actually know that reference. Do you, Rob? Theory X, theory Y? No. Theory X managers think that, uh, is it theory X? I think, oh, there's also person A, person B, type A, type B. It's a very common idea in psychology Not that people that fall into two categories. One, which is they're all wonderful human beings and the other ones that all out to get you. And, mm. uh, and the truth lies somewhere in between. Because if they're out to get you, it's usually because you've given them reason to be. Ooh, that one has to hit on your sweet spot, Rob. <laughs> go on, Rob. You, go on, Rob. Tell us, what, tell us, tell us about your sweet Don't spot. Don't get him spot. started. <laughs> if you want to listen to that one, yeah, go on the archives. Resilience unraveled. Russell turns the mic on me. We talk all about bad bosses and toxic leadership. So yeah, definitely check that one out. Yeah. Now, Russell, I'm curious, right? Like you said, of course, is we ought to start treating folks as adults. And you, you also mentioned that like many workplaces were not doing this. Like how do we start as leaders to allow our folks to be adults? And how do we build that trust and that mindset both ourselves but also with the folks that work for us well the first thing is to be really clear what, what your expectations are with people against their competencies whatever it might be against the task in hand and against the current workload and their cap cap capacity both uh physical and co cognitive and sit down with them and say this is the work that i need you to do by a certain time you, you negotiate that you may do some coaching through that process and you let people get on and do their jobs and then when they come back, you're going to sit down with them and say, this is what went well. Or you're going to sit down and say, this is not what I wanted. Or you're going to have that conversation as you go. And um, and you're going to have regular touch points where you sit down and say to people, this is great. And I really like it because then we're, you know, usually we're doing positive reinforcement and we're doing it in an adult sort of way. Or we're sitting down with people and saying, this is not so great. And this is this is how it needs to be. And what will you do to get it there? Because obviously, I would, being a coach, I would take that environment, that that world. And if people don't have the skills, we skill them up, and then we we're having an honest to and through, forth, back and forward about the job, the expectations, and all the rubbish that sits in a uh, within a process which stops people doing their job well. I mean, you know as well as I do that most poor performance comes from really poor internal processes, harmonized and taken together and encapsulated in a piece of software. I mean, I'm working with an organization at the moment and they have, I, I went in, the first thing I said to them was get rid of your software. And they said, well, you haven't seen it yet. You haven't even switched it on. I said, I know it's SaaS. I know it's at least 15 years old. So I know it's absolutely appalling. And then, no, it's great. It's great. It can do this, 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 and this. And I said, yeah, it says that in the box, but can it do it? Oh, yes. Then you ask three people. It's terrible. Please, please, if you do nothing else, get rid of the software. And we spend so much of our life fighting fighting in and of course what ends up happening is we fight in our meetings so they turn into sort of playground experiences we're fighting with the software we're fighting with our bosses where and everybody is actually becoming more increasingly miserable because actually expectations are growing and growing and growing and we're creating a climate where we're saying we want better growth but actually we spend most of our time fighting fighting the internal processes and i've always been a great believer especially of quality management systems years ago <laughs> and because I'm much older than you two put together, I remember years ago when the quality movement, I think it was Tom Peters, um, got excited. Was it Tom Peters? I always think of Stock Aitken and Waterman, but I guess people, Tom Peters anyway, used to bang on about quality. And so what we said was, let's turn it, let's systematize it. Let's make lots of money out of it. Let's have lots of consultants writing quality manuals. And um, I always remember going to a financial services organization and the quality manual was 18 ledgers big so they were these were documents which must have been about oh 100, 150 160 pages and some of that was to do with financial compliance and understand that 
And I went to their competitors who were really brilliant, really fantastic. And I said, let's have a look at your quality manual. And it was something like 14 pages. And they said, we got the creative person to write the quality manual. Because actually, if you send the quality manual, we have to do it. So we just figured out the things we had to do rather than measuring everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then wondering when the quality consultants came in why we kept for failing because we were doing all this stuff over here and all this stuff over there and we created an organization that was so hard to work in that nobody did the process because of course people have a natural ability to build processes that go along because what they do is they take the easiest route and what we do is we're on often fighting our people who have the the secret to doing the job better quicker more slickly more innovatively, more, you know, we're actually doing the job themselves. And we're often saying, no, no, you can't do it that way because 80, page 87 on the quality manual says you have to press this button first. And so for me, and I'm not advocating that you throw away quality because in certain certain places that's really important, but but it is a it's a, it's a philosophy which embeds the organization in structure, which is old fashioned. Because as soon as you know that you have old fashioned processes, what you're doing is you're, you're stopping people's natural ability to innovate. And human beings, and I've never seen any, uh, any, anything contrary to this belief, but if you put a bunch of human beings in a room, they'll begin to innovate and they can't help themselves. Even the people who supposedly can't innovate, all the people who sit there and say, oh no, I'm not innovative. No, no, I can't. No, I've got to have this. And I've worked with autistic people and people with a wide variety of neurodivergent conditions. And you put them in the room together and someone will always say, we could do this better. And that's just starting that process. So for me, it's about, as leaders, how do we strip away the stuff that stops people doing their jobs? And often, we're the people in the way. Is that why stress is so high in your humble opinion? Rob threw out a stat here for us to talk about. Zipia reported that 89% of Americans have suffered from burnout in the last year. I believe that's the highest burnout's ever been. So is that why our people are so stressed? Is that we're not allowing them to innovate the processes? Or what is your understanding of why that number is so high? Well, let me get my other soapbox out that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling. Here it is. On I go. On we go. <laughs> well, but you see, the thing is, burnout is now a word that means nothing. Uh oh, another one. Another one, because of course, burnout was invented for the caring professions. It was about uh, the caring professions. Ah, uh, that's and true. And it was, yeah. I think, it's Freitzenberger in the seventies, a German psychologist. He came up with the concept and came up with the initial definition. And someone in the states, I can't remember the name, uh, Amy, somebody. Uh, um, I'm terrible with names today, do forgive me, but um, sort of reinvented the term a little bit. And so the idea of um, burnout originally is actually how you lose your empathy by overwhelm, not through overwork, by right? being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So you lose your ability to care and have empathy because the boundaries between yourself and the person for whom you're caring become breached. And so you can imagine now, now you say it like that, now and then you apply to a lawyer and they're saying, well, I'm working 130 hours a week. Well, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. That's nothing. That's just that's just over. That's just overwork, not overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And and so now when we measure burnout, what we're doing is we're measuring overwork. And what's interesting about burnout, of course, now the way it's been categorized is it's a workplace condition. So this is this new definition. So basically, if you've got burnout in your business, it's because you are committing many heinous leadership crimes. It's not the fault of your people if you have burnout. It's the fault of the leadership. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is if you're citing a quote like that, what you're actually telling me is leadership in your world, part of the world, is really terrible. Because And then because what leaders do is to say, well, look, I'll carry on causing burnout by overloading you, giving you insufficient tools, treating you like a fool, um, expecting you to work, you know, all these hours for very, you know, insufficient cash and all these different things and creating this culture where we're all me, me, me. And um, what I'll do is I'll give you some resilience training. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so true. And I, and I walk in and I'll sit down with people and I'll say, okay, first thing, let's have a look at you. Let's have a look at your burnout problems. I say, yeah, people are this, are people are like that. And I'll just say, how much time do you spend in meetings every week? And they'll all say, far too much time. And I'll say, no meeting should be longer than 20 minutes ever again. And burnout score drops straight away. 
because there's an absolute correlation between the value that someone gets out of the meeting and the person that runs it. So in other words, if you're running a meeting, you think it's great. And for just about everybody else, it's a waste of life. <laughs> We've and heard that the, before. Yeah. And it's the number one co cause of burnout. Everybody thinks it's overwork. It's not. It's over meetings. And yeah, well, you know, what can I say? It's And people, what we don't do is we don't get into this, you know, how many times have you heard the expression? especially now in a Zoom or Teams culture, I go to work, I sit in Teams calls from whatever time in the morning to whatever time at night, and when I push up the computer down, I start to do my job. How many times have we heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is a heinous leadership crime. So we should be sitting down with people and saying, why are you spending so much time in meetings? Oh, well, this person, and how many? And it's the old stuff, you know, all the old things about poor meetings. I, I did a piece of work, I think I, you and I talked about this, Rob, there was a sales director who was running an international team, had 200 people in the sales function. And they spent the whole, every single Monday for a whole day doing sales reviews. A whole day with 200 people. Just think about the return on investment from that day. Not, <laughs> we know it's a, it's a minus number, isn't it? And then when they, were, when they decided that they were behind on their targets, now, you know, call me old fashioned. <laughs> I sat down and said, well, so what do you think your solution should be? He said, I think we need to spend longer in the meeting. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> seriously don't you think it would be more used to have people out there selling <laughs> no because i'm motivating he said i'm motivating them i said i think that's highly unlikely because like, you haven't motivated me in two hours and i mean this is the conversation we had and this is the trouble the vast majority of people you know mass majority, vast majority of burnout issues are because organizational processes are created to make people do their do their suboptimal work I stopped talking then. That That's was good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely shell fits. It, well, it definitely fits. We had an expert on our show, Mimi, right? Uh, who has this a whole a whole uh, podcast on this very subject, and she was actually talking about this. Right? It's just like we really aren't as leaders. We really aren't set up properly in terms of understanding just how important it is to be strategic, right? In terms of how you set up meetings, how long those meetings go for, the purpose of those meetings, right? Like there's just a lot that goes into that that I don't think a lot of leaders are aware of because they don't get that kind of leadership development and training now, do they? But but it goes but it goes beyond before that. And I like the way you use the word strategic then, because we've got a big pushback going against the word strategic now. We do we're strategy. Another now, one. Another one. Because actually <laughs> it's only five minutes since we invented it. But I, I used to work actually a client of mine who's in Toronto. We I used to run a leisure program for him. And he used to say to me, I hate the word strategic. We just call it long-term planning instead, which I thought was quite a clever way of thinking about it. He is a very clever bloke, actually. Um but there's a sort of a, a myth that actually happens in lots of organizations where, so I'm working with a couple of entrepreneurs at the moment, nice sized firm, three, three, three three and a half million dollar turnover sort of idea in the creative space. And they're sitting there talking to me and saying, why, do, why don't people work as hard as us? Why don't they care as much as us? Why don't they, as much as us, why don't they insert your own word as much as us? And it's like I think that I think there's something in that about leadership, especially in small businesses. They people genuinely and naively think they should care as much as the people who are taking all the money out. And I said to them, "Well, you're only paying them this much. Oh, but that shouldn't matter. They should care as much as us." And I think that's part of it because I think the strategy thing is all about how do we how do I achieve my strategic goals for my business, forgetting that people's individual strategic goals can be completely different and they're only working there for a few years until they have the ability to move on and escape your toxic culture and move to a different type of culture to move them towards their own strategic and career goals. And I think the coalescence of corporate strategy or goals or long-term planning and an individual's is the key here. But how often do we talk about that? Because we're sort of terrified to have a conversation that starts like this. On the day that you're inducted in the organization, the first question you ask is, when do you think you're going to leave? And then you get that conversation into the world and you say, 
where you should, I'm thinking it could be here for a couple of years. These are my ambitions, right? Okay, we need to help you achieve those ambitions and you're going to help us achieve ours. Now we have something that's explicit between us and come to the end of that two years, we're sitting down and thinking, so how's that two year window going? We'd like to keep you, would you like to stay? Yeah, but I need to achieve these things now. Great, we need to achieve these things. Let's see. Now in the old days, again, I refer to the old days. <laughs> We used to call this the psychological contract. And honestly, and I know it became known as the psychological contract, but it is actually the key thing about having these honest conversations with people, okay. just talking to them as if they're adults. You don't need books about radical candor. You just need to talk to people as if they're adults and let them react in a way that they think is appropriate and then figure out as a leader what you think it's in them for them to re respond in the way that they've done. And then you have a conversation about it. Then we're all adults. Then we all move forward together because everyone has a vested interest in achieving the same outcome. Why are leaders so afraid to have that conversation, do you think? I think what, there's a What narrative. they might find? Well, perhaps? yes. You see, you see, this the thing is, if your thing is, why don't people X as, as much as me, then yeah. the idea that someone might leave People take that as almost like a personal insult rather than saying to yourself, yeah, you know, I'm not going to, and that's the classic thing, isn't it? I'm not going to train these people because they might leave. So in other words, you're keeping people who are unskilled and incapable of leaving in your organization. And again, it's that idea we, you know, is we're, we're constantly doing this thing now. And I think we're going to see this in the future. I think we're going to see the concept of the revolving door more um, sort of, prevalent in the work so mm. today i work for you in five years time you could be i could be your client you could be my client i could be working for you i could be contracting for you i could be doing a project for you and vice versa and i think we're going to see careers developing this way so actually we have a vested interest in developing people to leave to go on and do their best work to maybe build a company that's bigger and ours for who will we be in to work and make money from in the future and i don't think we think enough about that and I think that is where work will be going soon. Oh, for, for sure. We had some experts on our show talking about that, right? Okay. Like it's, I think it's it, it, the challenge that I see in working with a leader's mindset, right? Or the expectations. So, so some of my boomer leaders, they don't have that expectation that their people are going to necessarily leave. So they do have the expectation that while they're there and getting a paycheck, they should be playing all out. It's A plus B equals C. But yeah. then you look at the stats on millennials, they're going to have like 10 different careers and the Gen Z is even more than that. Right. And then you kind of sprinkle in AI a little bit. We had an expert from Microsoft talking about this, William A. Adams. Right. He says the future of work. And that's not that far off, according to him. Now, thanks to the pandemic that's accelerated technology. But when AI comes on the scene, then it's just going to be project work for the most part. We're not even necessarily going to have that type of loyalty to an actual organization so yeah I think, uh, and i think we haven't i think we haven't seen the blowback on uh, ai yet just wait until someone sits down and does a multi-billion lawsuit against um open ai against the infringement of copyright against all those different sites that are hacking off to to produce those articles that's going to happen that's going to curtail AI. And, you know, we're already seeing different organize, uh, different types of work streams like counselling and coaching is two of those areas uh, which, are, which are a problem. And people are saying in, in AI, there'll never be anything new created because everything will just be regurgitated. So the future of work for human beings is to be in that unique artistic space. And that's the bit that's miss missing. That, you know, creating symphony or, uh, symphonies or pop music or creative arts and those sorts of things. AI has become, uh, become a tool. And like all IT things, you know, the promise of it is way, way, way behind what it's going to achieve. I mean, I, you know, I was at the, at the dawn of the internet when we used to talk about this thing. And um, it's taken many, many years to get the internet to a stage where marketeers have ruined it for everybody. And it's the same with, you know, <laughs> Facebook and all the rest of them, all these sort of social media platforms. It's become quicker until marketing's completely corrupted them, but it still takes longer than you think. And it may well be that AI is not quite as scary. I mean, one of the biggest victims, we all know that that's going to happen to AI is Microsoft, because everyone's actually predicting the end of Microsoft already. But they've only been predicting that for how many decades now? <laughs> <laughs> and long may, as an Apple fan, long long may continue. <laughs> Sorry, Robert. Russell, we've got we to gotta ask you 
our big question before we get you out of here. And that is, what do you want your legacy to be? My legacy? Um, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I love that answer, actually. We've never had that answer in all 160 whatever shows we're on now. Because I think I think legacy formation is glib. And I think people have what they think is a soundbite that people want to hear. And uh, I think it's more profound than that. And uh, no, not sure yet. Well, we'll have to have you back, sir. <laughs> yeah, it was a good. Yeah. I love I love the question. I think it finds out more about your guests than it does about the question itself. But I think it's great. I love I love the question. You got me thinking now. Again, we'll have you. We'll have to have you back for part two, where you can yes answer the question once you've had a chance to meditate on it. <laughs> I'm not, not going to meditate. No. Okay. <laughs> However, you get down with finding profound answers to profound questions. We'll have to have you back then, sir. Uh, it usually involves cake. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer too. Alrighty, folks. So obviously if you want to connect with Russell, we've dropped his LinkedIn in the podcast notes. You can check out his website, qedod.com. And also wherever you're listening to Leadership Launchpad Project, search for Resilience Unraveled and hit subscribe there. And if you want to go back, I was on his show talking about bad bosses I guess it was a few months ago. So yeah. definitely you were good, check though. that one out. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I remember that. Is we there, link is that there in anywhere the show else note. you want folks to find you, Russell? Say again? Is there anywhere else you want folks to find you? I think LinkedIn, qedod.com, as you say, a resilience unraveled is fine. And uh, soon there'll be one of these, authors, one of the, I'll get around one of these days to put an author's page on Amazon, put a few. I've actually written three books, but I've not quite got around to. One of them, you'll, you'll, you'll think this is amusing, I hope, because I did write it three years ago. And in it, one of the chapters, I said, managers should it be all over three new IT concepts, AI, AI AR, and VR. And I'm thinking, why didn't I publish that three yeah. years ago? And it's that difference between people who are leaders who are good at the the, uh, the idea, ideation and then the people who are really good at actually getting things done. So I could do with some more people like that in my organization. <laughs> That's all about constructing a team, right? <laughs> Cobbler's children, I think, is the phrase we all use in the UK. <laughs> All righty, folks. And for us, obviously, hit subscribe to the Leadership Launchpad Project on your favorite podcast platform and head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com for all your leadership needs, as well as EliteHighPerformance.com slash Legacy League. We have one month free in that community. And so you can interact with folks like Susan and I, as well as fellow leaders in our community. So check that out as well. Susan, where do you want to leave us today? I just think where I want to leave us is kind of where we landed this interview, talking about the future of work and that the future of work for human beings, certainly being mostly creative, innovative stuff. And we know how much stress and burnout reduces our ability to be creative and expansive, right? So I feel like this interview just really makes the case for why this aspect of brain training is so freaking important, both for the leader themselves and for their teams and organizations. How about you, sir? It. Yeah, and for me, I just want to echo what Russell said around the ability or the the lack of leadership towards folks working through barriers every day and this is something obviously I experienced a lot in my career is the processes the tools the softwares the and it does land in many folks's experiences not having authority or control or power over what they're doing and that is that slope down the burnout and the stress and so part of it is totally the mindset and what you can and cannot control. And the other part is the practical, what you actually can and cannot tr control. And so as leaders, we have to be aware of both of these things and set our folks up for success. Mm -hmm. Russell, it was a, a pleasure to wax poetically with you again, and we'll look forward to next time. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy. 
And everyone out there, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>